problem of anxiety seems to be increasing among children and youth, or at least the number of diagnoses seems to be increasing. Recent uh, studies suggest uh, that up to one in five, and other studies one in eight children, suffer from moderate or severe anxiety. There is much confusion in the field. More and more professionals are trying uh, to treat a problem, address a problem that they don't understand. And as a result of this, they are resorting to hand-me-down uh, kinds of strategies uh, that are used for adults, like medication and uh, confronting irrational perceptions. These, as I hope we are able to see, have, are more focusing on symptoms uh, than really the root of the problem. What I hope to do this evening is, in less than an hour, try to make sense of anxiety to you. That is a daunting task, uh, so you'll need to fasten your seat belts. Uh, I'm most anxious about being able to do that in an hour. As uh, those of you that know me know, I take a long time to do most anything. <laughs> and uh, so that will be a challenge for me. And uh, I, I admit that it is somewhat arrogant, if not awfully arrogant of me, to try to make sense in less than an hour of a problem that has challenged the most brilliant minds for generations, for a century really. But I am very fortunate. I believe I am standing at just the right place at the right time to be able to hold on to enough pieces, both historically and in terms of what is being offered from neuroscience now, in terms of my, my familiarity with attachment theory and uh, with a developmental approach to actually have a chance to put those pieces together. And so I have been able to piggyback on those brilliant minds uh, to, uh, to hopefully uh, make a contribution to this problem. I hope you experience it that way. So I'll begin with the, uh, the making sense. Now, a whole lot of making sense depends upon the questions you ask. If you can ask the right question that gives you that window uh, that suddenly it sheds light on something. And so I'm going to take you through a process of questions that I asked myself and I asked of the material in putting this together and hopefully that linear progression can help you as well. It's, it's very difficult and very visual. It's always difficult to get something into a linear progression. Uh, but I'm, I'm uh, going to start and I'm going to start at the beginning with six questions and first of all, what is anxiety and where does it come from? Now the word came into the English language from Latin. It means uneasy or troubled. That's where the word came from, but where does anxiety come from? But first of all, we'll flesh out that word uh, and give it a more contemporary definition, a vague, and that's very important here, a vague sense of unsafety and unease. I don't feel safe. I don't feel at ease. Characterized by apprehension, which is both cognitive and emotional, and restlessness. And so you have a definition uh, that most would use for anxiety, but what is it about? This, this has challenged, as I said, some of the greatest minds. What is it about? Where does it come from? And it's now with neuroscience that we've been able to crack that code. Uh, in one sense, it is very, very simple. Uh, in another sense, it is incredibly complex. But for the simple part, it is simply one subjective experience of an activated alarm system. There is a huge alarm system, a very complex alarm system uh, that we have in our brains and that is very deep. Uh, it, it, uh, it involves all kinds of components that serves that serves us, it is actually activated by six months of age in gestation. And this alarm system, and this is the way to think of it, because when you think of alarm system, you can think of all kinds of things that go along with it. Uh, false alarm, a true alarm, uh, we, uh, uh, all the language uh, that that brings with us. But this already changes the dance with the child and yourself. Because now when you feel anxiety, you know that it's a subjective tip 
of the alarm iceberg. That is, when you see a child who is anxious in whatever form it is, it's simply telling you that the child is alarmed, doesn't feel safe. Now, we'll flesh that out, but already the dance changes. This is an insight approach. In other words, the belief is that what you do is most determined by what you see more than anything else. And unless we see correctly, we're not going to do correctly. And so you begin right there seeing the child as alarmed. And so that brings us, of course, to the next question. What is the alarm system and how does it work? Well, there's huge neuroscience labs being dedicated to that right now, uh, being able to uncover just what it is. Uh, it, is uh, it is a complicated system that involves the limbic system, the emotional, and it's very appropriate here uh, that this is education of the heart because this is just what it is. We focus on the heart, the emotional, the limbic system. It involves attentional mechanisms. It involves the endocrine system. It involves the sympathetic nervous system, and we could go on and on. We could take a whole university course in it and barely, barely touch the surface. But for all intents and purposes, what we need to know is, is that it's a complex system, a very significant system system. Uh, and it is structured, the anatomy of alarm, if we look at it in terms of consciousness, what we're most aware is our perceptions, although interesting enough, that's not what comes first. With alarm as we understand it, what comes first is down about the middle. It's actually the emotion. That comes first and it's our limbic system which actually it, it senses us just like a startled response. And then it fills in the big question is, what's wrong? What's wrong? And so the perceptions are actually filling in, trying to glean the information about what it is. So in this case, the heart comes first, the mind comes second. That's very important to understand because that's part of what messes us up so much. Part of what gets so confused because the heart comes first and it is almost it's instant uh, that happens below consciousness. And with emotion, there's impulses. There may or may not be feelings. Uh, feelings are the conscious part of, it, of emotion. All mammals, all mammals have this alarm system. And as far as we know, only humans are conscious of their emotion, in other words, have feelings. And so what we're talking about is something that is that we have in common with all mammals. Uh, all mammals have a limbic system. And so underneath emotion, we have physiology. There's a chemistry, a physiology to this that, again, involves the endocrine system. It involves the autonomic nervous system. Uh, we have a chemistry, neurotransmitters, a neurochemistry uh, that's involved with it, uh, with the anatomy of alarm. The the uh, we have epinephrine, adrenaline, and so on, and all of these things that are there. Uh, so this is, I'll come back to this later on to flesh this out, about what can go wrong with the alarm system, because things can go wrong with it. It's a fragile system. It is a very narrow window of functioning. Uh, things can easily go wrong with it, and this is where the, uh, uh, to try and make sense of this is to find our way through. But first of all, I want to put a brief puzzle or a puzzle together uh, for you. Uh, putting the pieces together, that's actually my life's work. I love to pull, put pieces together uh, until they make sense, uh, until you can see the picture that emerges. And uh, in, in years, uh, Lynn said it was 30 years, I think it's 40 years now that I, uh, since I started private practice of, of working with anxious adults and anxious children. Uh, and uh, in studying, uh, again, putting the pieces together in terms of neuroscience, uh, I'm going to give a brief picture of how it works. And there are a number of possible outcomes to being alarmed. And in fact, it seems like there are three possible outcomes to being alarmed. And so it would be appropriate here to use the analogy then of a traffic circle. We have alarm coming into the system. And the first thing what ha when we're alarmed, the very, very first thing that we're, the alarm stirs us up, but the first thing that we're moved to do is like any alarm would move us to. The whole purpose of the alarm is to move us to caution. That's why we instinctively raise our voice 
when a child is heading for trouble. Sean! We use that raised voice, and what it's supposed to do, we're supposed to see in their eyes that little tremor of alarm. <laughs> We've activated the amygdala, and now everything is there. And the first thing they say is, what? What's wrong? Which is exactly what's supposed to happen. And then we say, watch out, you're heading for trouble, uh, you're going to be sorry, uh, that's not what to do, and we fill it in. Except for so many children, that doesn't work. Something's wrong. That's how it's meant to work, and you can see why a child with an alarm system on the blink creates a yeller out of a parent. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Because instinctively, you're trying to make up for it because you want to see that tremor in them, and that's, that's, that's exactly the point. And so it, this goes to the very core of parenting, and it's a very fact that our children are not being moved to caution so much anymore that we find ourselves looking for all kinds of tricks to compensate for that. No, nature had already taken care of this. This is in our design. The problem lies deeper. Something is amiss. Something is amiss. The alarm system often is not working right. Now, there's many, many things that a child cannot avoid. Many things in a child's life. A child's life is full of alarming futilities. Grandma dying, parents splitting, brother not liking me. Daddy going on a trip, keeping mommy home, rejection of a friend, being liked by everyone, and it goes on and on and on, not mattering as, you, as much as you would like, the loss or death of someone that you're attached to, not being wanted, chosen, or preferred. And we could go on, the inevitability of death, the passing of time, we hit a wall of futility. Now, the brain is already equipped to handle this. If the futility sinks in, and again, this is a matter of the heart because it's a feeling. We actually have feelings of futility. When the feelings of futility sink in, uh, an incredible thing happens. If they sink in, the amygdala sends signals to the lacrimal glands and the eyes water. And so for thousands of years, we have associated tears with inner transformation, when we're up against the things that we cannot change, we become transformed by those things, by the process of adaptation. And there are many things that we cannot avoid in life, many alarming things that we cannot avoid. And when we can't avoid them, it's very clear from this that we need to have our tears about them. We need to have those tears of utility. No, the tears to onions don't count, nor the tears to simply upset. There's many kinds of tears. The tears of futility are a very special kind of tear. It requires a very soft heart to be able to experience it and a safe place for the child to have his tears. One of the most significant things that I learned in terms of working with children with very, very high alarm, whether it was in the prison system or in private practice, was the ones that were in chronic alarm were dry-eyed. They had lost these tears of futility many for many years. In fact, when young children could experience these tears, often the ex even very severe symptoms of obsessiveness and compulsiveness uh, would, uh, would, would melt away, at least for an hour or two in the wake of it. But then you knew the way through. We have lost as a society we have lost the wisdom of being able to have our tears about the things that we cannot change, especially the alarming futilities in life. And I believe this is one of the reasons why our anxiety is, is rising so much. This is a matter of the heart. You can't think yourself out of this one. In fact, the more you think, the more anxious you get. There is no other way out of this one except to feel that's how we are meant to become resilient. This is how we were meant to find rest and relief and our children to find rest and relief. That's why they need their tears when up against the things they cannot change. That's how the system recalibrates so they discover that they can handle a certain amount of alarm in their life and alarming things. Uh, it leads to resilience. The brain discovers that they survived things not working and it leads to resourcefulness. 
Again, these are all attributes. No child is born with these. These come as a result of adaptation. And human adaptation is a pathway of tears. Um, and so the answer to anxiety, surprisingly, has to do with these tears of futility. Now there's yet another route, another pathway. Especially when one lacks the tears of futility, there's still another door that's open here. And that door is very important. And of course that door is what the existentialists always used to talk about. And that's the door of courage. And Rollo May, if you are familiar with him, spoke of this, of how important it is to take up a relationship with alarm and not let, let alarm get in the way. Uh, he spoke often uh, that uh, life was full of desire, yes, but on the treasure that we yearned for sat dragons. Dragons, those things that we were alarmed for, and so they often went hand in hand. The dragon sat on, sat on the treasure, and most treasures were guarded by dragons. And so how are we to deal with this? Well, courage as he expressed, and I remember being riveted in a lecture of his, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is when we don't let fear get in the way of life. It doesn't require courage when you have no fear. But how do we get to this place? How can it happen? It requires mixed feelings. You have to be able to see both the dragon and the treasure simultaneously. And now we know that the prefrontal cortex, that front part of the limbic system, doesn't even start developing to five to seven years of age. And for very sensitive children, it takes much longer to be able to get the mixed feelings that are there. And so the ultimate resolution to alarm doesn't even start developing until later, uh, later in childhood. And we know now that it's still under construction even in adolescence. It takes time. It takes time to develop this answer. It requires mixed feelings, very simply. It requires a functioning and a developed prefrontal cortex. Now, the point here is, if a child is not capable of mixed feelings, they will not experience these simultaneously. Either they will be full of alarm and move to caution, I don't want to go, mommy, it scares me, it scares me. Or, they, or they're all full of desire. Oh, it'll be okay, I want to go. And many of you have that experience uh, for all kinds of things. I want to be involved in the school play. But then all of a sudden, the child realizes that they may be laughed at. And, uh, and, but they don't experience them at the same time. And again, that takes a, a whole lot of development before nature's ultimate resolution of alarm is realized. Until then, they need lots of tears about the things that they cannot change, about the alarming futilities, that there's nothing left to do but cry. And if they, if they don't, again, the alarm continues higher and higher. There's so many of these examples. I would like to ask a question, but I might appear stupid. I would like to stand up for a friend, but maybe others won't like me. To wear what I'd prefer, but then I'll be seen as different. I'd like to share my story, but it may not be interesting. I'd like to express my opinion, but others may not approve, and on and on and on. And we have the, we have the problem of the dragon and, and uh, the treasure. But again, this can't be solved until a child is actually capable of saying on one hand and on the other hand, part of me feels this way and part of me feels that way. And many children don't say this. None of the kids that I worked with in the prison system could say that. And all of them had lost their tears. And all of them were suffering from incredible alarm problems. In fact, as I'll talk about later, when we took pictures of their brains, the alarm system was dysfunctional, completely dysfunctional. It was completely on the, on the blink. So what do we learn from this? Feeling alarm should move us to caution if that is possible. To cry, or, or to caution, yes, sorry, if, if that is possible, to cry if that is futile, and to take courage if what alarms is in our way. The three possible outcomes. And we, as parents and therapists, actually stand as traffic directors, deciding which way we should encourage the outcome of alarm. Which of these natural outcomes would be appropriate in this situation? To encourage a child, to help them find their tears, or to be able to help them move to caution, 
These would be the three outcomes uh, to have to, uh, uh, to, to look at. Now, we'll go on. What is it that alarms us so? Why do we have this alarm system? Why is it, uh, it's, it's one of the most phenomenal systems uh, and most integrated systems in, in, uh, uh, in the human structure? Why? Now, the answer to this is an answer that most neuroscientists have not figured out. And the reason for that is, is many of them know nothing of attachment theory. But when you understand attachment theory, this is the part that is so obvious. It's so obvious. Attachment, um, facing the lack or loss of proximity with what or whom we are attached to, facing separation is what alarms us so. How do we make sense of that? Well, it ends up that attachment is our preeminent need. The less developed we are, the more important that need is. Attachment is all about the pursuit of proximity, of contact and closeness in one way or another. Now, there's this pursuit of proximity, first of all, is the senses, to be with mom and dad, with those that we're attached to, to keep proximity, whether it is a transitional object, the teddy bear, uh, the sibling, and so on. And when there's a separation, it triggers alarm. Understandably, because we need proximity, we need connection for our survival. So it makes perfect sense. If this is a preeminent need, this is exactly what is meant to trigger alarm. And so any time that child, that infant, faces separation, it is triggering alarm. Any time we face separation, it is triggering alarm. But we have to flesh out what that separation means. We don't really understand that until we can understand how we are seeking proximity. And in actual fact, the first six years of life ideally are about the development of relationship. Year after year, yet another way of seeking proximity develops. But this also means that there's a different way of experiencing separation. Now, I'm using a plant analogy. On top of the soil, we see the growth and maturation part, but it's underneath the soil that counts. That's where the attachment roots are. And the first one, as I mentioned, is, is this is usually how we think of attachment, is attachment through the senses, to be in sight, to be in smell, to be in hearing, to be in touch. This is huge. It drives Facebook. <laughs> and you can also see why our children are getting more anxious. It is huge. It, uh, it is all about contact and closeness. Yet it is meant to be the most primitive of these and the primitive only. By the second year of life, it is all about becoming like. We feel close to those that we're like. We want to be the same as. But now that opens up a whole nother way of separation to be different then. And now this becomes a source of anxiety, but I'm not like you, but I'm different then. By the third year of life, it comes a whole nother experience of closeness or proximity. The child wants to belong. He wants to be on the same side as... He wants, and here we have the instincts of loyalty to stand up for, uh, to, to protect, to serve, to obey. All of these instincts are about closeness. When the child doesn't experience that sense of belonging uh, with those that they're attached to, the, the alarm goes off. If all goes well, and this moves deeper, uh, by the fourth year of life, it becomes incredibly important for that child to matter. He feels close to those to, that he is dear to. And so he wants to be dear. And when he doesn't experience a sense of mattering, when he doesn't experience a sense of being important, when he doesn't experience a sense of significance, again, he's facing separation. By the fifth year of life, the heart gets incredibly involved. If everything goes well, this is when the limbic system pulls out all the stops and the child gives his heart to whomever he's attached. This is when the first I love you's come out that are so heartfelt. Before he said it out of imitation, 
And now it's said from the deepest place in the heart, but when you give your heart away, you risk it being broken. And now you have a whole nother way of experiencing separation. Because now when you don't see, don't feel the warmth, you don't experience the delight in the eye of somebody else that you're around, you're facing separation, the alarm goes off. And now we have another source of anxiety. And if that wasn't enough, by the sixth year of life, if everything goes well, it will occur to a child who's, who's fully developing the capacity for a relate, relationship that to be close means to be known, to be seen and heard from the inside out, to have no secrets that would come between. And now when that child has a secret, it alarms them. Do you know how many kids and how many clients I've had through the years in which that source of alarm that was going on was a secret, especially one they could not afford to tell mommy? Because when that is there, it generated an alarm that was huge. And so this is another, yet another way uh, to review here. The attachment alarm, you need to understand how we seek closeness to understand how we face separation as human beings. When you understand what a child is seeking closeness to and how, you begin to understand where they are facing separation. Very common experiences of separation for children, very alarming experiences. Birth, bedtime. Bedtime is the big one. Because what happens at bedtime is the child faces separation. And you can see the problem with today's strategies because it pushes the child even into more separation. We've taken wrong turns, and it's one of the reasons, I think, uh, our children are experiencing so much anxiety. Of course, the arrival of a sibling means more separation from mom and dad and uh, moving and all of those things. Parents working, going to school, daycare, camp, shuffling between parents, boarding school, not being chosen, wanted, liked, recognized, not being significant or valued, favored by those attached to. Of course, by the time you end up to be three years of age, if you're precocious, three and a half, if you're precocious, it dawns on you that something bad could happen to mommy or daddy. This goes through the roof. And now you've had a child who hasn't experienced any anxiety whatsoever, has been able to sleep through the night and all of these things, and you got an obsessive compulsive child on your hands who's got anxiety all over the place. Where did it come from? They figured it out. They figured it out. It is the most alarming experience of all. It's simply developmental. If that wasn't bad enough, as Rolla May suggested, even the very act of becoming your own person means that now you feel separate. And so you get anxiety, you get alarm just from growing up. And then when you're 12 and 13 and you don't feel so close to your parents anymore, wham, another whole dose of alarm, and you walk through a high school, grade 7 or grade 8, and it's buzzing with alarm. It's part of the territory. It's exactly what is happening. You go to the roots of it, and you see that, no, what is happening here? Children are facing separation. When they face separation, they become alarmed. This is the way the brain was meant to work. There's no pathology in this. This was exactly the way it is meant. We live in a universe in which every little thing we're concerned about disorder. From a developmental point of view, we don't start that way. We ask, what is the order in this? What is the meaning in this? Did nature have something in mind? It turns out it did. It had something very important to, it had in mind. We've been pathologizing what nature was trying to do is to move us to caution, to move us to tears, and to move us to courage. And we're so concerned that there's something wrong. No, there's proper ways of all of this. When you experience your inevitable insecurity, there is nothing left to do but cry. Even the word anxiety, what was that word about anyway? Why haven't we always talked about the alarm system? Why doesn't our language talk about the alarm system instead of such vague ways? Well, it turns out the answer to that is it is very difficult to see the separation we are facing. It blinds us. 
very much like the sun is all around us, but you can't look at it directly. It will blind you. It's exactly the same with separation. It is the most significant experience, yet it is a vulnerability too much to bear for many of us. And that is the issue of human vulnerability. One of the most important issues of the heart is the fact that, it's, that in our emotion, we feel our woundedness. We get hurt. And sometimes the injury, sometimes the hurt, the vulnerability can be too much to bear. You can't see it. You can't see it. This is often the case. There are defenses uh, that are erected. And the defenses that we now know, uh, there are defenses in the, in the limbic system. And we simply, some of the feelings are numbed out. I'll just touch on those briefly a bit later. And another way that the brain does it, a very important way, is that it tunes out the perceptions that would lead to vulnerable feelings. And so we actually can't see that which would, which would make us feel too bad. We actually can't see that which alarms us. And now the story of anxiety starts unfolding for us. If I can diagram it this way, we have in the center the hardest to look at, the most difficult in terms of vulnerability, the blinding experiences. On the side, the peripheral, not selected or chosen perhaps, that's facing separation. Can't find teddy bear. Uh, sometimes that's really big. Uh, grandma might die. Depends on how important grandma is, whether that can be seen or not. Uh, slighted by peers, not liked by teacher, uh, different than others. Uh, not invited to the birthday party. Mainly these will be on the peripheral. Children will be able to see these and primarily name them. Most of them will. But let's get to some of the big ones. I don't feel like mommy likes me. Never feel like, I don't feel invited to exist in her presence. None of the kids in the prison could ever name that one. It's estimated that 75% or more maternal rejection was at the core. Mom decided she would rather live with somebody else, and the child was the odd person out. And yet, I never met one of these kids in prison that could name it. When it gets that close, we can't see it. And yet, they were showing all the signs of high alarm, not invited into the presence of a primary attachment, Separation from the life we are attached to. Becker's denial of death. The biggest, the biggest of all our mortality. We have such trouble looking it in the eye. It blinds us. And so when we're blinded to these things, it not only accentuates all of the ones around it, those become big deals all of a sudden, those become the hooks, but there's something else that happens. When we become blinded by the experiences that affect us the most, it orphans the feelings of alarm, divorcing them from their cause. The brain can't stand that. It's a meaning-making organism. It's got to know what's wrong. And if, if it's not fed with the information about what's wrong, it simply starts inventing reasons. And that's what it does. So it displaces, first of all, alarm to what can be seen, and so now the dark was a problem, but now the dark is a real big problem. Well, uh, and so and it displaces it, and it gives rise to alarming obsessions that is irrational reasons for alarm. I call this cognitive backfill. It's when the brain simply invents. It has certain themes that it uses. Something is out of order. That's one of my favorite. And when I'm alarmed, I reorganize my office and my files, and I can't find anything after that. But boy, that's the most orderly conduct I ever have is when I'm alarmed. Uh, something's out to get me. There's monsters under the bed. Or we have paranoia. Uh, or the a circumstance or situation is associated with alarm, and we develop all our phobias. Or there's unfinished business. There's locks that uh, I haven't locked, or cupboard doors that I haven't done, or the iron might be on. And, uh, or I need to keep, keep my purse to bed, or, and on and on and on and on. Or I might get sick. Uh, or in all of these kinds of things, in our brain events, explanations after explanations. I'll never fit in. I'm going to get lost. You'll forget me someplace. It's not safe to fly. Something's wrong with me. 
I might lose control. I might get sick, and so on, and so on, and so on. But what's underneath it is simply blinded by the separation we're experiencing. And so we could call it alarm without eyes. How does defense of blindness disable the alarm system? Well, when you put the pieces together, you can see, and I'm just going to give you an example here. We've got this huge issue of human vulnerability. We know now that we can be defended against a vulnerability too much to bear. There's no problem when it's situational. The problem is when our defenses get stuck. And so our perceptions could be knocked out. We're not seeing so well. We're blinded to this. We don't see the lack of invitation in somebody's eyes. That should alarm us. And so we're much more gregarious than we should be. Uh, and you, you know people like this. They just don't read the fact that your invitation to exist in my presence is over now. And <laughs> it should be a little bit alarming and move them to caution, but they don't get it. They don't get it. And there's all kinds of things that can happen with this. Uh, and so this gives rise, of course, is anxiety, which is full of agitation and apprehension. This is the vagueness part of it, right? But there's a deeper thing that can happen, a deeper... The brain can actually knock out the feelings and even some of the impulses that the child doesn't move so much to caution anymore. And so the child becomes restless and reckless. First of all, we have agitation, but there's no apprehension. The child is not saying, I feel unsafe. The child uses no language on, on safety at all. In fact, if you ask him, he says, I'm not scared. Oh my goodness. We're all scared. Do you know how many children are running around now who have no feelings of not being safe? Many parents are proud of these children, They're saying, they, you know, my boy doesn't feel any fear. This is of huge concern because that same boy will be reckless, careless, will not be moved to caution. His alarm system is not working, will get into trouble. But we have this huge agitation but lacking apprehension. But we even have a deeper one. And that is the brain can go right to the physiology, the arousal system. And it can calm the child right down. So instead of agitation, the child now presents as cool as a cucumber. You would never know they were alarmed. And so now we have another one in which they now seek the adrenaline that's associated with the alarm. And we have a rising phenomenon of these children as adolescents who actually do alarming things like cutting themselves just for the adrenaline rush of it. In fact, our adolescent wards are being filled with female cutters throughout North America and in Northern Europe. Something is going on. Wrong. Not only are our children are highly alarmed, but they're becoming highly defended against alarm, giving rise to a generation or increasing number of adrenaline seekers. And so we actually have, when we look at it, we have three problems. We have anxiety-based problems. We have agitation-based problems. We have adrenaline-based problems. Three alarm systems. Now, if you look at these, the anxiety-based signs include uh, not feeling safe, anxiety-reducing behaviors, phobias, nightmares, obsessions, uh, compulsions, panic attacks. The agitation-based, the child doesn't actually feel unsafe. Right? Doesn't feel scared or nervous. There's hyperness, tension, restlessness, recklessness, can't stay out of harm's way, doesn't see trouble coming, impulsive and scattered attention. The adrenaline-based problems, devoid of feelings of alarm, attracted to what alarms, lacks attachment, conscious conscience and engages in alarming behavior. Now, I hope you feel, those of you that are anxious, like this is actually better than the alternatives. <laughs> We're not bad off, are we? It could be a whole lot worse. It could be. And the diagnosis of children that, that, uh, that, uh, that are characterized by agitation-based alarm problems and adrenaline-based pro alarm problems are actually increasing. And I'm convinced that it's many of these doctors that are thinking that there's something wrong with the rest of us anxious neurotic people. <laughs> when in fact, we're better off. We're much better off. We have an alarm system, it's much better to feel it than not. Even if we can't quite figure it out, even if it leads to some obsessive compulsiveness, we're much better to feel it than, than without. 
Uh, this is not the worst problem at all. It simply doesn't present very well because we feel miserable. The others don't feel their pain. We do. And that's one of the problems. So how does it work? The dysfunction of, of defendedness here, going back to anxiety. We're blind to the true source of alarm. Uh, gives rise to anxiety. Unfortunately, when we're blind to the true source of alarm, we can't really confront it. We can't take up a relationship with it. And so courage does not become possible. Although we can be courageous uh, with our anxiety, we don't actually get courageous uh, with the source of our anxiety, which is really what is needed for us to make headway. And we can't really cry about the thing that doesn't work because we don't know what's not working. We can't name it. We don't feel the futility around it. And so it tends to be also we don't tend to have the sadness that we need around us. And so all the energy goes into caution. And of course, those of us that are anxious tend to be overconscious, overconscientious, overcautious, overconscientious, and overconcerned. And not only that, our caution is skewed because it is not directed to that which alarms. <clears throat> And that's where we get the irrational obsessions and compulsive behaviors. For every obsession, there's a whole uh, uh, assorted uh, <laughs> compulsive behaviors that go with it, which creates this anxiety loop that we have that is so, that is so troubling in the anxiety. Uh, when we have anxiety, it just loops and loops. There's no way out. The anxiety doesn't de decrease, it, it continually gets more. We're not able to deal with the source or find any other outlet. And of course, we all know the typical signs of elevated anxiety, unrelenting sense that something is wrong or that something bad is going to happen, persistent feelings of nervousness or tension, lack of safety, dreams reflect the emotional theme of alarm, as nightmares and the motor energy of alarm can find release through nervous tics and muscle spasms and periodic waves of unexplained panic. We all know those of us that have experienced anxiety about these signs and symptoms. And of course, it leads to yet another issue here in which anxiety reduction becomes part of, of the picture. And uh, this anxiety is incredibly uncomfortable. And so we naturally gravitate towards sucking and chewing and nail biting and eating. Why? Because it evokes the parasympathetic nervous system which is the opposite of the sympathetic nervous system. Just watch those hockey coaches, baseball coaches, uh, and so and just watch them at this. Highly, th these are the activities that are there. Um, uh, it can be rhythmic activity, stimulation, rocking, pacing, music with a beat, swinging, flickering fire, watching waves, worry beads, stroking, twirling hair, seeking comfort through contact with transitional objects. You'll all be familiar with this as parents. Physical exertion, why? Because it moves the sympathetic nervous system to its very peak and then goes into parasympathetic nervous response. And so you've got about an hour free of anxiety. Doesn't get rid of the problem, but it is huge in terms of reducing the anxiety symptoms. It's huge, and of course, the alcohol works directly on the alarm. Uh, marijuana works on the arousal system. Uh, there are so many different axes to this. They're inventing something almost every month that has a new axis to the alarm system. But all it does is manage the symptoms. It never deals with the problem. And that's the important thing to realize. Why is anxiety increasing in our children? Why is it? Well, we could talk about this uh, for, for a while, but time does not allow. One, I think children are experiencing more separation than they've ever have. Part of it is because of what I talk about in my book. They become peer-oriented. They're orbiting around their peers. But that means if they do, they suffer, they face separation continually because now they are much more vulnerable. The more a peer matters to them, the more they face the possibility of not being liked, not being wanted, look at them on Facebook. All you have to do is chart how much the anxiety on your own child went up when they got into the social media. And you'll get the picture. You'll get the picture. Today's kids are wired. They are facing separation all over the place. 
Children are, are failing to develop deep attachments, the more primitive their attachments. And look at them. Those that have deep attachments aren't even wanting uh, to... Uh, uh, they're not the ones that are texting all the time because this is just being in touch. There's no meaningful, heartfelt connection there. It's not attached at the heart. Those with the deeper attachments, even though they can experience the sting of, a, of coldness, they still have so many more ways of holding on when physically apart. And they're much better off. They're not nearly as vulnerable to, to anxiety. As I said, children are becoming more peer-oriented. And the peer-oriented is a recipe for alarm. One of the things that we can do uh, and that we must do is win our children back. Children are becoming more alpha. This is a huge topic and one that I address in other places. Uh, but this is, this is huge in attachment. It turns out uh, that uh, the whole purpose of attachment is to take care of each other. And it has two sets of instincts. We don't attach like this. We attach like this. Because it, it, the brain has to facilitate one to take care of the other. And so it moves to a whole set of dependent instincts to look up to, uh, to defer to, to take direction from. And a whole set of alpha instincts to take over, to take charge, uh, to assume responsibility, to give direction, and so on. Now the problem is, is that a child must be depending upon us for them to feel safe. When children become alpha, you can't make them feel safe. And so our children are becoming, the alpha children is becoming an epidemic in our society. Children who are bossy, prescriptive, who have to have the last word. They appear as strong, but when you look at them, they're highly alarmed. It is a ticket to anxiety. The alarm only comes down when they can feel taken care of by another strong alpha presence. But our problem in today's society is we're putting children in the lead. Well, honey, is that okay? Would you like to do this? And so on. And the more we do this to them, the more we put them in charge, the more alarm they get. Now we make them irresponsible for their own anxiety, saying that if they think right, they won't feel that way. They're kids. We are responsible for them. It is our job to make them feel safe. This is an issue for us as parents and teachers not to push into children. That it's your fault you feel anxious because you must not be thinking right. No. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Parents are resorting to alarming their children. Of course, we up the ante in alarm when the alarm system goes down with kids. And that's understandable and natural. And so, but the cycle just goes on. And I believe we, separation-based discipline is becoming the norm. The research shows that 70 to 80% of today's young parents are either using timeouts, which pushes the fa child's face into what? Separation. Or consequences. Now, when you use a consequence, you look around for what a child is attached to, cares about, so you can use that against them. So we're pushing children's face into separation. That's why our grandparents, who may not have done other things very well, at least knew that this was not a starter. You didn't use these kinds of things because bottom line is you never pushed a child's face into separation. We don't handle that as humans. That's a vulnerability too much to bear. And we're doing this all over the place. Even our solution for sleep problems is to close the door and say to a child, no more contact. Nope. No more pee. No more water. Nothing. Now you're isolated until you come down. Well, they calm down eventually because of defendedness. It's simply a vulnerability too much to bear. But we don't do separation. And our children are experiencing much too much separation. Let me bring this part to a close. Feeling alarmed, therefore, by review here. We get alarmed when facing separation. That's pretty self-evident when you see it. And when feeling alarmed, we should be moved to caution, if that is possible, 
pardon the typo here, move to cry if that is futile, and move to take courage if what alarms is in our way. When the, the problem is, is that we become blinded to what alarms us, our brain events reasons for what is wrong, and we have the story of anxiety. The story of anxiety is all around obsessions about what is wrong and compulsions that flow from it. And when the anxiety builds up, we start to engage in anxiety-reducing behavior. What is the answer? Very simply, is a proper working alarm system where we can see what is alarming us and we're appropriately moved. Now, when I was reading the tributes to Maura Sendak, Sendak, I think that's the way you say it, the author of Where the Wild Things Are, <coughs> just recently deceased, and uh, I, um, I was struck by something he said. Of course, I was struck by Where the Wild Things Are, and you can see all kinds of applications here, all kinds of applications, but I was struck by something he said in an interview a year before his death. He certainly lived what he preached, so to speak, to children. And it's a very simple quote, a very simple quote. And the quote is this, I'm not unhappy. I cry a lot. Now, I'm not unhappy. I'm just sad. Think of it. Think of it. He says, I'm not unhappy. I cry a lot. So the two things are different, you see. I am moved to sadness. I cry a lot. Why? Because I miss people. He's touching the futility. He's facing separation. They die, and I can't stop them. Now, isn't that a statement of futility? They leave me, and I love them more. Most of us would be tempted to detach. And he embraces what he loves. There are so many beautiful things in the world which I will have to leave when I die. Talk about facing mortality and ultimate separation. But I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Facing the separation with the people and things he is attached to. Finding his tears concerning the futility of holding on, courageously embracing his loves, even though it sets him up for feeling more pain. I would aspire to be so sad and to be so brave when facing a separation that cannot be avoided. I can't think of a better solution to the problem of anxiety. In the end, it comes up to be something incredibly intuitive, incredibly simple, something all of you probably knew already, but forgotten that you knew. Maybe didn't have the language that you knew. The issue of anxiety is an issue of alarm. The issue of alarm is facing separation. Facing separation is an issue of vulnerability. Sometimes it's too much to bear. There's many alarming futilities in life, and when there is, there's nothing left to do but cry. And hopefully, a child can find his tears in a safe place to have his tears. And then, ultimately, ultimately, the dragons are sitting on our treasures, and the challenge is to not let fear get in our way. Hopefully, that theory makes sense to you.